in my being berserker video, I hit on this a little bit and then ended up having a conversation with somebody in the comments about it. And I believe that individual actually used mushrooms in their practice. Disclaimer, I'm not advocating use of drugs or anything like that. I don't partake myself, um, despite doing security in the cannabis industry. I've never partaken. If you are gonna do something like that, of course, recommendation to do it where it's legal. <laughs> Colorado, I guess. And of course, be safe about it. Do your research. In order to research for this video, I looked up a lot of videos and there's a lot of dirty hippies out there with varying opinions. So, you know, of course, be careful. Dirty hippies seem pretty knowledgeable, even though some of them kind of contradict each other. As your counselor, I'm here to tell you about drugs and alcohol and why they're bad. Okay. So my opinion going into this was that the berserkers did not take any kind of drugs in order to go into their, their fury. It's plausible that they took it during their spiritual practices, and that was, again, the premise that I was, was starting with. You'll see throughout the video different opinions. Um, I've got a bunch of tabs pulled up here in my laptop in order to cite sources and whatnot. And of course, all the links in this will be in the description below so that you can do further research because I'm not going to read every single website verbatim. And if you want to, you can look up stuff in your free time. And I mean, there's there's a ton of stuff, as you'll come to find out. So one of the reasons of doing this is there's not, one, there's not enough Berserker videos out there. It's something people are highly interested in, but there's just not a lot of information out there. There's a lot of misinformation out there. A few of the videos that I'll put in the description, uh, there's one by Lindy Beige, who I vehemently disagree with, at least in this video. He's got a, a bunch of other pretty good uh, videos on historical accuracy and whatnot including a really funny one about an old Troy movie. But he is very adamant in his video that the Berserker used mushrooms. And that was like the entirety of his video. And I was like... And then uh, Skullagrim uh, actually has a pretty decent video on it. If you're unfamiliar with him, which is kind of doubtful seeing as he's got over a million followers. But he, <laughs> he does uh, a lot of like sword videos and stuff, um, as well as historical accuracy videos. But, and he actually mentions um, the first individual that I'm going to talk about is a Swedish theologian who uh, came up with the theory. And then there's uh, Skeptoid, which I wish I could have cited in my Being Berserker video, but I absolutely could not remember what the, the video was. And he has a pretty decent video slash website. I'll put them both in the description. Um, the website is kind of verbatim what he's talking about in, in the video. Uh, I believe he's got a podcast, but I'm not sure. Yeah, he mentions, and I'll, I'll go over it in a little bit, what you know he, he believes is actually the cause of um, the Berserker Gong, the Gunger, the, the, the Berserker Fury. And then of course, uh, Jackson Crawford is always a good source, and I'll also put his video about it down there. We'll kind of get to the, the content of those last two as I'm as I'm talking. So Samuel Odman, Samuel Lawrence Odman, was the guy that came up with this theory. He was a theologian. He became a professor of theology at Uppsala University in 1799 and served, among other things, as inspector of four student nations. And it goes over the nations, not that that's relevant to us at all. Um, his father was a priest, and so was his grandfather. And I guess when he was about a year old, he was actually sent to live with his grandfather. Um, so heavy Christian background. And he made this same mistake that Snorri Sturluson did when he equated the Asir to Asia. So this is on the Skeptoid site. How could ordinary men become so supernaturally vicious? Most modern explanations for Berserker Gong invoke the hallucinogenic Fly Agaric. Uh, the reason it's called Fly Agaric is because apparently a way to kill flies is to literally put it in milk and I guess the flies land on it and drink the thing and die because it's a toxic mushroom. Amnita muscaria. I find this a poor theory for three reasons. First, we should discuss Berserker Gong and the sagas, uh, which he does. It was suggested by the Swedish theologian Samuel Oldman in 1784 based on stories about Siberian shamans using it for visions. There was never anything to connect the mushrooms to the Vikings or to any behavior similar to Berserker Gong. It is the theory devoid of evidence, plausibility, yet it remains most often repeated. He made the mistake of the false etymology of thinking the Asir and Asia came from the same root. Likewise, there's no historical references whatsoever that the Norse used flyagaric 
or flug swamp, flug swamp, which is the Swedish, which would be a sweet name for a goblin, I think. And of course, uh, Amanita muscaria is the scientific name. So just looking at Samuel Lawrence Odman, not a whole lot of basis in actual fact. There's another guy, Howard Faving, who in the Scientific Monthly in 1956 wrote an article, Ongoing Berserk, a Neurochemical Inquiry. And he states quite a lot of stuff about mushrooms. It's fairly factual from what I understand. But the actual lore that he cites, and I believe Skeptoid mentions this too, there's nothing that corroborates. And I believe... Arngrim and his sons and Angantyr, the, the sword that his daughter gets from him, has some similarity, but first off, uh, I, I'll just read the first couple of sentences and you can kind of get it. Berserk was a mighty hero. There's no, there's nobody named Berserk in the sagas. So it's the first fallacious statement. The hero in Norse mythology, legend states that he was the grandson of the mythical eight-handed Starkadr, which again, not a person. Starkov, uh, which is often anglicized as Starkadr because the F is very often mistranslated as a D. There, there are guys named him, but nobody with eight hands. <laughs> so it's not a thing. He was renowned for his consumed bravery and for the fury of his attack and battle. And so just from those first couple of lines, you get that he's not very well versed in the actual lore itself. He's just kind of possibly going off of Samuel Oldman's theories as well. Then if you go into the side effects of the actual drug, the mushroom, it can cause like rage, but it also causes, and I believe it depends on how you prepare it, back in the day in order to get rid of a lot of these side effects you would have literally had to drink piss, but some of the side effects are diarrhea, sweating, vertigo, and sedation. It can make you tired. <laughs> So, looking at some of the stuff on WebMD, Aga, as they call it for some reason, is unsafe when taken by mouth. It can cause side effects such as sleepiness, confusion, dizziness, delirium, and death. From what I understand, the death is rare. It's still a, something to be wary of, and I believe it depends on the, the preparation. But, again, not into all that, so I have no idea. I'm just from what I'm researching here. Yeah, other than maybe confusion, uh, it doesn't seem like a whole lot can be equated with the ganger. And then sciencedirect.com says, Symptoms. The onset of symptoms is rapid after significant exposure. 0.5 to 1.5 hours. So that's pretty short. Gastrointestinal discomfort is uncommon and neurologic and psychotropic effects dominate. Inebriation, euphoria, I don't remember a whole lot of Berserker being happy. Alternating with anxiety, confusion, illusions, delusions, hallucination, agitation, and violent behavior. So there's violent behavior. More uncommon symptoms are myclonic jerks, I believe that's muscles, if I remember correctly, muscle facilitation, and convulsions, a CNS depression, and unconsciousness may follow heavy exposure, especially in panther cap poisoning, which I'm not really entirely sure what that is. And this is actually a pretty decent uh, website. It goes over like all the chemicals and stuff like that. I kind of skimmed through it because it was just a lot of uh, technical jargon that honestly doesn't stick too well in the brain. Not my forte. Not my forte. Unfortunate. So and this is from a site that talks about cooking mushrooms and stuff. Forager chef. With my Scandinavian heritage, I love all things Viking. When I was in high school, I remember hearing talk about Viking warriors ingesting hallucinogenic mushrooms before entering battle, which at the time I assumed must be psilocybin containing mushrooms. These are your typical shrooms. Apparently the Amanita muscaria has uh, muscalin in it and not the psilocybin, so it's a little bit different than like your regular Grateful Dead mushrooms. R.G. Wasson claims they were eating mushrooms. I'm not sure who that is. This would seem to make sense since eating can give a person vastly increased strength and a feeling of fearlessness. So it is said, imagining a Viking Berserker charging at you high as a giraffe, but it's quite a thought. Which again, the direct ingestion is actually the worst way to ingest it from what I understand. The most toxic, the most lethal. And that's, that's where you're going to have the most issues like, it, without any treatment whatsoever to the, the mushroom before ingestion. You're going to feel the full effects of the diarrhea and the vomiting and all that stuff. And this is a quote that looks like from... Soma, divine mushroom of immortality. No one who discusses the fly agaric in Europe can ignore the debate that has been carried on for almost two centuries in Scandinavia on this issue. So, this video was not the beginning, nor will it be the end. <laughs> uh, first Samuel Oldman in 1784, and then Frederick Christian Schubler 
in 1886, propounded the thesis that these Viking warriors known as Berserks ate the fly agaric before they went berserk. In short, that berserk raging was deliberately caused by the ingestion of our spotted Amanita. So these theories are coming out way later by Christians, which always makes me wary because Christians didn't see pagans in a positive light, so why not claim that they did drugs, right? So now that I've knocked the crap out of defending my argument, uh, it is possible that it was taken for religious purposes. I think the side effects show that to invoke the actual fury for battle probably was very unlikely. And then speaking from experience, the, the adrenal rush that I feel, which can come on like all the time. I mean, it, I'm actually gonna uh, do a future video on coping slash redirecting that, that nature, which I talked a little bit about it in my Bean Berserker video, but might as well expand on smaller things, right? Like this. So the reindeer herders, which is what Siberia was doing, they, as well as the Sami people in Finland, they are the ones known for taking the Amanita and utilizing it for religious purposes. If you remember from a few of my previous videos, I've mentioned that the word shaman comes from Tangerism, and Tangerists come from the steppe, from like that area and surrounding areas. So like Siberia would, would definitely qualify as at least adjacent. And then the Sami are actually where we get a lot of our Seth traditions. So it's entirely possible that in Seder, taking the Amanita Muscaria was a practice. They have found in vulva graves nightshade, which may have been used to elicit similar effects, since it is a toxic substance. I have no idea how that's prepared. So, you know, again, if that's your get down, please be safe about it, including legally safe. So somebody that expands on that idea, and if you follow Joe Rogan at all, because he talks about mushrooms like all the time. How many species of mushrooms are there? At 21, yeah. how could you not allow them to take mushrooms too? To wear a mushroom hat. Have you ever read any Terrence McKenna? I know you're familiar with something called the stoned ape theory. No. Sorry, not. McKenna, it was a, he was a, an ethnobotanist, and he was also a psychedelic adventurer, and he had a theory. And the theory was that the what you're talking about, this ch climate change, uh, that also coincided with the doubling of the human brain size, th his theory was that one of the things that was in play was that these apes would experiment with different food sources as they moved into the grasslands. And there was a lot of undulates in mm -hmm. these grasslands. And that psilocybin mushrooms, which we know existed back then, would grow in these grasslands. And that these monkeys, these apes rather, started consuming psilocybin mushrooms and it led them to be more creative and it also led to specific traits like the development of language. That eating mushrooms um, in low doses increases visual acuity which would lead them to be better hunters or more perceptive. It also leads them to be hornier which would uh, most likely involve more breeding, more sexual activity, and possibly select the, the ones that chose the, the mushrooms would maybe possibly breed more than the ones that didn't choose the mushrooms because they were more into it, they were more social, more uh, sexually active. And he has a, a series of, uh, like, the, his brother Dennis, who's still alive, detailed it on a podcast we did, the very first podcast we did, in, his brother is, a, is, a, is an actual scientist, and detailed it in terms of how psilocybin affects the brain and what areas of the brain, it, it, what, what, what actually takes place when you're under the influence of this, and that it could very potentially have led to the development of language, and that this, all these things in play, the throwing arm, the, uh, you know, developing these new social networks, uh, where, where you, you need to communicate with each other, along with the harnessing of fire, along with the consumption right. of psychedelic mushrooms right. on a regular basis, because they were incredibly frequent and very edible. He's, he's a big fan of hallucinogen. There's a book created by a fairly interesting individual, John M. Allegro. Uh, he started out as a Christian and eventually became agnostic, 
who was actually one of the guys that was deciphering the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he ended up having a falling out with some of them. I'll read from his Wikipedia to kind of clarify that. As early as 1956, Allegro held controversial views regarding the content of the scrolls, stating in Later to DeVoe, it's a pity that you and your friends cannot conceive of anything written about Christianity without trying to grind some ecclesiastical or non-ecclesiastical acts. The bulk of his work on the Dead Sea Scrolls was done by 1960, when he was at odds with his scrolls colleagues when a conflict broke out with H.H. H. Rowley concerning Allegro's interpretation of the scrolls. Allegro, on the invitation of F.F. Bruce, moved from the Department of Near East Studies to the Facility of Arts at Manchester to the Facility of Theology. It was during his stay in theology that he wrote his controversial book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. That's the big one where he equates the mushroom to Santa Claus and all that. <laughs> Whose subtitle was A Study on the Nature and Origins of Christianity Within the Fertility Cults of the Ancient Near East. Apparently re realizing the impact of his, his book would have, Allegro resigned from his post at Manchester. So he's an interesting individual who goes from being like super Christian to agnostic because of the knowledge that he got. And I'll put a link to the book uh, in the description as well. So essentially he talks about how the shaman, I can't verify this too much, but there's like so many people that, that take his thing and kind of like run with it too. But he believes that the shaman were the proto Santa Claus. It's picked up little things here and there. It's possible there's also an influence on Odin. Um, and Odin is kind of our shaman archetype, so not not too much of a stretch, I don't think. It's the shaman during the Yule season, which for them wouldn't be Yule, but you get the idea. They would dress in red with like white spots, similar to the mushroom, red and white. And they would go from house to house, apparently climbing down the top of the chimney part of the yurt, which is strange. I don't know what's up with that. I did so much research on this already, so uh, and I'm sure I'll do more. And who knows, maybe a year from now I'll update a video on this, but they would give out the mushrooms and they would get food in return. Uh, so a lot of similarities to Santa Claus and then obviously the association with the reindeer. Apparently, if you're doing the mushroom out in reindeer area because the urine has the effects of the mushrooms, the reindeer will like knock you over just to get at your mushroom pee. <laughs> That's something to watch out for if, if you decide to do that. And there's actually a thing on the US Forest Service website that talks about fly agaric's influence on modern midwinter and Christmas celebrations. And I mean, essentially just goes over what I said. Yeah, it's pretty funny that his book has been, has been that influential that a government website would put it on there. I don't have no idea if they're trying to warn people or sell them on it, <laughs> whatever. Here's a quote from Fabing that kind of equates with Odin and, and the Flugsvamp. What in particular seems to me to argue for Flugsvamp, the delightful Swedish name for Flagger, is the fact that to partake of it is a custom from part of Asia from which the pagan god Odin, with his pantheon, made their migration to our north. The history of the berserks in the north begins with Odin's coming, which again is because of the etymological mistranslation. I think Fabian is probably just a terrible source because he just didn't really know the history. I mean, it's not like Google was a thing back then, but I would hope that somebody in the scientific community, <laughs> even in the 50s, would have access to better information. But, you know, what do you do? Uh, so here's a quote on, I can only assume is a Dirty Hippies blog, Andy Letcher. Again, I'll put that in the thing below. This is about the Sammy specifically. Um, he said, this week I made my annual visit to Abbott's Bromley, Horn nets, and there I met a ranger herder and with herds in both Britain and Scandinavia. We got chatting and I asked him whether it was true that the reindeer have a taste for human urine. Quite true, they'll lap it up in the snow and then unprompted he told me the following story. Once while living amongst the Sami, his host started feeding reindeer with fly agarics, which the deer consumed with some relish. Waiting for the nature to take its course, the fruits of micturition were collected in a bucket strapped to the animal's flanks, perhaps. Boiled up in a pot, I'm guessing to concentrate the brew, or perhaps to make it more potable, and shared round. I a quote. I don't drink, and I've never taken any drugs, he told me. Uh, but I took some when they passed it around. Well, you have to, don't you? 
they expected anyway. I was high as a kite. I was high as a kite, it says it twice. But there was an old 80 year old grandmother with us and I fancied her, that's how high I was, high as a bloody kite. So there's uh, somebody's anecdote at least about the, the Sami using it to this day. Oh, and then there's also uh, a YouTube video that I found by Lawrence Millman where he actually went out with a uh, group of native Siberians. Uh, he mentions the tribe and everything, I can't remember it right now. Uh, once he gains their trust, he actually uh, partakes of the shroom, which is pretty interesting. It's a 37 minute video and the audio cuts out a couple of times, but it's still an interesting anecdote. So yeah, it looks like there's still a big kind of fat question mark on it for the most part. I think that it's pretty unlikely that um, it was done on the regular, they don't row you around from what I understand. And with the uh, the side effects, I don't believe that it would be taken before battle. I think that's more of something that's natural and in inherent in Berserker. I believe that it's entirely possible that it was used for religious reasons, but I don't think it was used for the Fury. Maybe the name Ganger could equate to a journey. So that is entirely possible that it's associated with that shamanic fury, that older energy, uh, which I'll do a video on in the future, is the, the passionate energy, right? That's Odin, Other, that's where that comes from. And that's that fury that Odin inspires. So it's entirely possible that it was a religious practice. But again, it's kind of one of those things where you have to make a personal decision on whether you believe it or not. It's definitely kind of got a big question mark on it. So yeah, while it's not something that I believe is conducive to battle, I mean, it's entirely possible that it was taken for religious reasons. And I don't think it's necessary, honestly. If it's part of your path, it's part of your path. As per usual, uh, like, subscribe, comment, do the thing. Apparently I was wrong about needing 4,000 minutes to get monetized. Apparently it's 4,000 watched hours, so... Maybe in a couple of years I'll be monetized. I have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, links to Patreon, Subscribestar, uh, Teespring, and Redbubble will be down there. I mean, the uh, sweet Berserker thing for this video. It's on my pages. Skull!